Did you know that you live in the golden age of data visualization? Imagine being a scientist like a hundred years ago. You're typing your paper up on a typewriter with your hands on touching ink. What if you make a mistake? I actually, I don't really know how you would fix a mistake on a typewriter. I think you could pull the paper out, put like the white out on it, and then you would have to realign it perfectly and then move the little ticker across and you could do that after it's dried. But that seems just like a huge mess. But how would you put in a plot? You would draw it with your hands. You would take rulers and protractors and stencils for the lettering and you would draw the plot and then you would mail it to a journal who would then make a stencil or like an etching of it and put it in. Wow. Can you imagine how little plots were in papers back then? Because who's going to make a plot? They can read the table. They can make their own plot. Just give them instructions on how to make the plot. Jump forward and you have photocopiers in like the 50s and 60s and you could draw a plot and you can make copies of it a lot more easily and you could do th really cool things with graphics that way and make pretty nice plots. Jump forward even further, you have computers and now you have programs to do data visualization. You can just make the plot and if it's wrong, you can just rewrite the program to remake the plot. Oh my gosh, what a freaking game changer. But you're still in the past, right? Like you're in the 80s, the internet exists, but not everybody's using the internet. You're, you're probably making your plots and putting them on a floppy disk and mailing the floppy disk to the journal who's just putting it into their computer. Can you imagine? You used to be able to send physical copies of things and people would just put it in their computer. Like, oh, it's, I can just put this in my computer without even worrying about it, it's fine. And because the journals were still printed, like people were not getting emails with the journals, there was a charge for like page number. There was a charge for plots. If you wanted a color plot, that was gonna be more expensive. So you're still limiting the number of plots in your journal articles. Push forward now, right now, we're in the future. Everything's online. I'm sure people are still receiving journals in libraries. I mean, I. <laughs> I would actually be surprised. No one's printing out the entire journal and putting it on their shelf anymore, right? You go to the archive, you print off the interesting papers and you look at those. Unless you're doing something like nature or a magazine, there's not really page limits anymore. There's not plot limits. And because we're on computers, there's certainly not a difference in a black and white plot and a color plot. We're in the future, which kind of leads to a problem. It's it's an embarrassment of riches. When you don't have to calculate the cost of each plot you're making, you can make as many plots as you want. And when there's not a hard limit on how many plots you can put on a paper, you don't really have to decide what's the best plot. Is this the best way to convey this information? You can just put whatever you think looks nice in your paper and that can cause problems. I'm going to talk about a bad plot. So you can have plots that are bad because they're misleading. Like think about those plots from the news where it's a pie chart, but it doesn't add up to a hundred or the scale is wonky. So like, they're like, look at this terrible trend, but it's like showing an increase in like less than a percentage point. You could also have bad plots that are just, not great for the intended audience. I talked a little bit about how, in general, the public does not understand how to read a log plot. So if you need to convey information to the public, that's not the best choice and you should do a linear plot. Think of something that's field specific. Like, have you seen these dark matter plots and it's got like the energy space that's predicted for dark matter and then they're blocking off regions with each specific experiment. Like, yeah, I look at that plot and I know what's happening and you can just put that in your paper and it's fine. But you would never show this in like a public talk. No one can read this unless you're like knee deep in the field, right? So that can be bad. But that's not really what I'm talking about either. Actually, all of those things I just discussed are good topics for videos. 
It's fine. This video is about a very specific type of bad plot. A bad plot that's just so bad, it, it baffles. You can make this plot, but should you? Does it make sense to? When would it ever make sense to make this plot? Never. This is the violin plot. Let's discuss. Okay, so the violin plot was introduced in a paper in 1998. The authors are Jerry L. Hintz and Ray D. Nelson, and the plot is titled Violin Plots, a box plot density trace synergism. First, I find it very interesting how in the 90s you could get a publication by just being like, we made a new type of plot. Cite us every time you use this plot. It's our plot, the violin plot. Very silly. I'm going to complain a lot about this plot, but first we have to understand what it is. It's a combination of two plots, right? First you have the box plot, which looks like this. This is a fine plot. I like it. It's great. Okay, so sometimes this is called a box plot with whiskers, but I've always just seen these referred to as box plots. They have five pieces of information on them. The middle line is the median of your data set. The very tips of your whiskers are the minimum value and the maximum value. And then this box gives you information about the quartiles. Am I referring to that right? You would call those quartiles, right? Like here's your plot, the median is Q2, and then Q1 and Q3 go out to the sides. When you put that on a box plot, that's, that's the width of your box. So it gives you all this information. So rather than just plotting a whole bunch of data points as like one average, you have all this information. Box plots, 10 out of 10. But a violin plot is a combination of a box plot and a density estimation. So what is that? If you have your all your little data points, like imagine you just have an Excel file with just a list of points, you could plot the frequency versus whatever you're measuring in a histogram that would look like this. Uh, you could use the histogram to make your violin plot, but people most often use what's called a PDF or probability density function where they kind of smooth over the histogram and they make like a nice little line. So you replace your histogram with a little line. So to make the violin plot, you take your histogram, you rotate it 90 degrees, you copy it over to the other side, you put your smooth PDF on top, you remove the histogram, and then you shove the box plot right in the middle. Violin plot. It's awful, right? It's bad. I mean, aesthetically, these are very ugly and hard to read and bad, but that's just my opinion. So instead, I would like to argue that they are bad at doing their job, which is to give data to the people. How, how do you read these? I have so many questions. A box plot talks about the average of a data set, and you most usually see it when you're comparing a bunch of data sets and you're like, here are all the averages, here's the trends. Great, we can see a trend, we see one point, we see the spread of the data, all of that information is clear and easy to read and important, fantastic. A density distribution is usually used when your data set is wonky and it doesn't make sense to just be like, here's the average. Like imagine a bimodal data set. It doesn't make sense to take the average of the data set because the average is in the middle of your two little humps, right? Saying this is the average doesn't really tell us information about the plot because it's kind of misleading, right? You have two little humps. The, the, the spread of this data is more important than what the average is. So when I think of the violin plot, I think of two disparate plots that should never be used together. Either your data can accurately be represented by an average, in which case you would use a box plot, or the data has a weird spread. The shape of the data is important and it doesn't make sense to just do an average. So you would use a different type of plot, a histogram. Why would you combine the two? What data set does it make sense to do that? None. It's just that they like the look of this, I guess. Uh, let's go through the paper because they have a plot. Let me show it to you. Look, look, at, look at A here. You've got a box plot with three points and all of these points seem to have the same average. So they're like, oh no, all these seem to have the same average. It makes it look like the data is the same. Oh my goodness, we should come up with a new kind of plot. And then they, they post plot B. This is a recreation of the plot from the paper. This is just prettier than the one in the paper because the paper was from the 90s. Plot B shows the violin plots. And look, you can see that especially for the bimodal data where the shape of the data is important, you see that, oh, this blue data set is very different from the other two data sets. 
oh my goodness, this is why the violin plot exists. This is the, the linchpin of their three page paper on please cite me when you make a violin plot, where they're like, see, it doesn't make sense to just plot these as averages because the data looks very different. And I just, yeah, the data does look different, which is why you would not plot the first plot. Like just plot three histograms and then we would see that the data is different. And you could put the averages in a little table and you could even write in the, the, in the plot, say, even though these averages are the same, look how different the spread of data is. The violin plot does not help us with this. The violin plot, okay, this is my second problem with the violin plot. You have these histograms on the side. What are the units? Because if you look at the plot, it's usually just like on the x-axis is the data set label. So it'll be like days of the week or like samples one, sample two. Where's, where are the units on this? Where are the tick marks? How can I actually compare the shapes of this data? Because I can't measure it. If I open a paper and I see a violin plot, if I want to actually get data out of it, I have to take it into a second program and like copy and paste each of the histograms and put them on top of each other and rotate it so that it actually looks like a plot I can read easily. And I shouldn't have to do that. I should not have to edit your plot so that I can read it. These violin plots are purely for aesthetics, which I mean, inappropriate for a science paper, but also like, really? You can't actually get data. You're just getting vibes. And that doesn't belong in a scientific paper. Have you ever seen someone with like a really like their whole body is deep into like the farmhouse aesthetic and you're like, this is just, too much like there's so many words what purpose does this serve that is the violin plot like why are you doing this i know you think it looks good that's your opinion and that's fine but it's not i can't get any information out of it honestly i think people know that these are bad i want to rephrase that i think the people who put these in their paper think they look good which they're incorrect about this is my channel my opinion these are just really ugly but they know that they're bad at conveying data because every single time you see a violin plot in the paper, which again is combining two types of information, averages and then density distribution, so like histograms, they also put the other types of plots. Like you'll see the violin plot and then it'll be like, oh, and here's just the histogram separately because obviously you can't fucking read this thing. So my question is why? It is this, this problem, like we're in the future we don't have to pay per plot, so we don't really have to think about is this a good plot or do I just think this is the cover of nature worthy? It's not. It's so bad. It's so ugly. I'm sorry I keep repeating it, but it's just not only is it a bad plot, which is the most important thing, it's just so ugly to look at. It doesn't tell me anything. What is the point of this? Why? I, I just want to highlight this. I found a paper from 2019. It's called Van der Waals Density Functional with Corrected C6 Coefficients. It's a real paper by real scientists. It's not my field. I think it's like physical chemistry, but I'm going to scroll down and show you the violin plot, which is, I mean, all of the figures. Look at these. These are so bad. What am I supposed to get out of this? Like, I don't want to shame these authors, but like, really? And you know, you know that they knew that you couldn't read these because if you scroll back up, they have the exact same info in the histograms. By the way, which I really like. I really like how they colored these histograms. I've never seen like this kooky pattern. I really like that. So they know you can't read the violin plot, but they liked the look of it, but they also have to include the histograms because otherwise you can't actually get any information out of the paper. Brings me to the point of smoothing. In the past, in the long ago, the far, far, far away, you would have to get out your numerical recipes in Fortran and you would have to look up how to make a histogram. And when reading that, they would say, here's how you can determine the bin widths. Here's what statistical equation you need to use when calculating errors based on those bin widths. And you would have to know the statistics behind that. Now, in the world, if you want to make a violin plot, you can just put stack overflow violin plot into your Google and you will be taken to a page and you can just copy a line of Python code and you can just put that and then you make the plot. And it's just like, what smoothing did you use? Why did you use that smoothing? Is it appropriate to use that smoothing value on your data set? Uh, here's an example. This plot is the same data as this plot. And the only thing they've changed is the smoothing. 
And when you see these violin plots, they are so overly smooth that it makes me think that the person just thought it looked good or that their sample size is so, so small that like they just have really smooth edges because it's two points in a histogram, which is another trend I've noticed in these violin plots. They don't talk about how they did the PDF. They don't talk about what smoothing value they used or why they used it. They just, it's smoothed. <laughs> which is fine, I guess, because no one's actually reading these plots. Everyone is just skipping right past them to get to the actual plot. But like science, it's important to like make arguments for why you did the thing. Why did you smooth this? Why did you think it was appropriate to make this? Why is this in your paper? I don't know if anyone who's ever put this in a paper can answer that question because they also always have the histogram and then a table with the averages because you can't, you can't read this plot because it's a bad plot. It's bad. I can make fun of myself here. I've got some bad plots and papers. Look at this. What is this? No one can read this, Angela. Why would you plot all of these separately? Just put them all on the same figure. What is this? Why would you do this? But at least you can read this. At least this has a purpose. It's a bad plot, I know, but at least it gives information. These don't do that. These are so bad that honestly, this screams grad student who's on LinkedIn following the absolute bottom of the barrel, worst style of influencer, the academia influencer. And they found some listicle that was like top 10 plots that are rarely used that will make your next paper sparkle. And they saw the violin plot and they were like, that looks cool. Incorrectly, they thought that looks cool. And they made it and they showed it to their advisor and the advisor was like, yeah, whatever, put it in the paper. Because what is this trying to say? When you are a mentor to a graduate student, you should ask, what, are, what information do you think the reader should get from this plot? Can they get that in a glance or is it obscured by the giant histograms on the sides of this data? What, are you trying to convey the different shapes of the data? Because in that case, we should do histograms. Or are you trying to show the moving average? Because then we could just do a line plot. You should, you, you, the mentor, should have stopped this from happening. How did these get into papers? I, I don't understand. I don't want to overstate their use in academia because this is a rare type of plot to see because I do think most people recognize that they're bad and you could do any other version of this plot to be better. I think it's more often seen in like the, the data is beautiful style communities where People are just grabbing data sets and trying to make really cool figures, which I love and support and is awesome. I want to take one of these and I want to show you my biggest argument, my proof that these are so bad, is that anytime you see a violin plot, you can instantly make it better by unmaking the violin plot. So this I pulled from the Data is Beautiful subreddit. Uh, this guy is just playing with data sets and making plots, and I think that's great. And I like the idea for this plot. He's plotting the percentage of states versus same-sex marriage laws, and he has these categories, constitutional ban, statutory ban, no law, and legal. And the goal of this is to show not really changing attitudes, but the way the whole country kind of moved towards legality. Let me play the violin plot for you. First, notice that because it's a violin plot, the percentage like spreads out above and below this like zero line, which doesn't make sense for percentages. Like percentages go from zero to one. Like why is it going down like that? That doesn't make sense. But also note that it kind of looks gross. <laughs> it looks like a pulsating like slug. I don't like the look of it. But let me show you this exact same plot, except I've doctored it to not be a violin plot. Now it's just a histogram. Oh my goodness. Isn't that lovely? We love to see it. That, that's a great plot. And it really shows nicely how the laws just like really quickly went from like ban, 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 ban to like legal all in a very short time. I like this plot. Although you can also kind of see how the smoothing affects the data because we have 50 states. It was either yes or no on it. So like, why do you have those really smooth lines going down? That doesn't really make sense for this type of data, but it's fine. I like this plot and I fixed it because now it's not a violin plot. <laughs> and and that's, that's my argument. You can look at any violin plot and automatically make it better by just making it a histogram, because that's what it should be. If the shape of the data is important, 
You need to have a histogram. Since it is science, you need to have axes and units and numbers, and you need to describe how you decided on the bin widths. Violin plots never have that information, and it needs to be there. If you ever find yourself starting to make a violin plot, what are you actually trying to plot? Are you plotting averages? Then just do a box plot. It's fine. Or is the shape of the data important? Because if the shape of the data is important, why can't we compare it? What is the scale? What are the axes? Why aren't these close enough together so I can just look at them? Oof, let me give you some examples of better. Okay, you could just stack the histograms. In Python, there's a parameter called alpha, and you can make them kind of see-through. You see these little lines, they've, they've done like the smooth PDF on top. I like how you can still see the bins. I think that's important when you're smoothing things a lot. Uh, but you could also just take these lines and just plot them and just describe in the paper what you've done. Like this, you see? You see how you can see all the shapes and they're all stacked together? You see it? You see how you can measure them against each other and there's units and stuff? Or what if you just want it to look cool because for some reason you think these look cool? 3D plot. Ooh, cool. It's a 3D histogram. Neat. See how you can still measure them against each other? See how there are units? Dope. Okay, here's my last suggestion. It's, it's called a ridgeline plot. These are beautiful. I don't understand why anyone has ever made a violin plot. Look at these. Just do this. You see how beautiful it is? You see the colors? You see how they're right next to each other so we can compare them? Ridgeline plot, there is a rock band that has an album. People are gonna be mad at me because I'm not saying who it is, I don't. But what if you like the violin plots, but they're not cluttered enough for you and you wanna make them harder to read? Can I introduce you the bean plot? Bean plot, a box plot alternative for visual comparison of distributions. This paper is from 2008. What is with this field just being like, I made a different style plot, cite me. This goes on my, this goes on my CV. I'm going to get tenure now. Bean plot. Look at figure one in this paper. On the left, you have a histogram and on the bottom, they've put little tick marks where the data points are, which I'm begging you to understand that's literally what a histogram is. That's what the histogram shows. Why would you put every single data point? It makes no sense. Fine. On the right, he's made a violin plot and then he just pasted all the data points into the center of the violin plot. I've seen these bean plots everywhere, especially in the data visualization community. And I just, why? It's hard to look at a bunch of data points. Why are they all there? The point of the histogram is so that you can get the information without having to have your brain figure it out because that's hard for brains to do. That's the point of the histogram. Why would you shove all the points on top? And I really don't like these because just like the violin plots have that like width dimension that's unitless on the plot and is not given any value and it's really annoying because like what is the definition of this? How can I compare it if you don't tell me what it is? They just do like a, a spread of points all over it and it's like okay but on the x-axis of your literal plot it's like this is Tuesday. Is it time of day? Why are the points spread? What does that mean? You just threw them all over. I know you did but you don't say it. It's so bad. It's so bad. Is this whole field just write a paper and make a plot? I actually looked it up and this field is like this, but the rest of the papers are like normal. It'll be like, here's a mathematical method to determine the best statistical approach to bin widths. And it's like, okay, that's math. That makes sense. This is just, this guy is just like, put all, put all the points on your violin plot. It's a bean plot now. Cite me instead. I just like the examples. The examples trying to show proof of concept are just so bad with both of these papers and it's just like how did anyone come to the conclusion that this is a good idea? These just look bad and because they're bad at giving data, it's purely aesthetic. Is this your aesthetic? Am I, am I wrong? I don't think so. These are ugly, right? In addition to the violin plot and the bean plot, you can also have the asymmetric violin plot and the asymmetric bean plot where you add another, you just throw more information. What if we just plotted everything on one plot? That's not confusing at all. These are better just because the histograms on each side, at least they're close enough that you can usually draw on them and figure out how related they are to each other. But 
I'm just getting real defeated as I'm recording this video because like so many people use these, they're just so bad. Like your whole job as a scientist is to be like, here's the data for my experiment and this is how you, do you, is this your final answer? Did you pay the page fee to get this published? Let, let me know in the comments below if you've ever co-authored a paper that has a, a bean plot or a violin plot and how did that conversation go? Was it one person really pushing for it or? Uh, if, if you are ever in that situation in the future and you don't want to put that plot in there because it's going to have your name on it and people are going to be like, is this what you think good data visualization is? Just link them this video. Like and subscribe and link them this video. I can be the asshole. Um, but really, just just you need to ask. Every time you make a plot, what is this trying to say? Because when people read academic papers, right, they read the abstract, they go through the plots, and they read the conclusions. And, and if it was good, they go back and read the text more thoroughly. But there are just so many papers. We don't have time to read them all. We're mostly just looking at plots. This is what your paper is going to be remembered as, and this doesn't say anything. When you make plots, you need to ask yourself, what am I trying to say here? Am I going to talk about the distribution of the data and what that looks like? Because you need a histogram. Or am I talking about the averages? In which, why are you clogging it up with these histograms? Why are you doing that? Just, just put a data point. A single line plot is fine. I will remember that way more than when I'm annoyed and I have to like open up paint and remove the histogram so I can actually look at the data. All right. Thanks for watching. I realize I can't end the video there. I'm gonna say something and I don't want you to laugh because it's not funny, okay? These plots look like You might have laughed because I think I'm gonna have to bleep the word But the fact that these look was is just a statement. Like that sentence ends in a period. Sometimes things look like genitalia, like whatever. I'm an adult, I don't care. But as other women before me have mentioned, because STEM, as a woman in STEM, you know, women are already underrepresented. The fact that these look like this is not a problem, but it can lead to uncomfortable situations. So <laughs> this is gonna be a really vulnerable moment for me. And I'm gonna tell you something that has actually happened, a real true story. At some indeterminate time in the past, I went to a journal club meeting. A journal club meeting is where you meet with like your cohort or the people who work in your department. We have them now at work, where because you wanna stay up on the literature, you grab a recent paper and you all meet and you discuss it. And the meeting is supposed to be like, you're pressured to actually read this paper and this will help us actually stay on top of literature. Nobody actually reads the papers. It's a huge problem. I don't know. But the, the format of Journal Club is like two to 20 people show up. Someone is nominated or they have been selected previously to present the paper. And then you discuss, assuming you've all read it, of course. You all read the paper, right? So on this particular day, I go to Physics Journal Club, which, you know, in physics, it's like 20 to 30% women. I'm used to being the only woman in the room. I'm fine with it. And honestly, this is just my personal experience. Like I know every woman won't have the same experience, but in physics, I have never experienced like overt sexism or misogyny from people above me. Like my professors, the people who have hired me, the people I've always worked closely with have never been sexist to me. And in fact, they're, they're mostly allies like, if you think of the people who came up in the 70s and 80s, they had women in their cohort. It would have been like 10% then. But those women were forced to leave because of, you know, all the reasons. Now, in my experience, they kind of look out for women. They want the room to just be comfortable. Like, you're not treated better than men, but like, they want you to be able to stay in the field. And I think that's great. And this has just been my personal experience in physics. In physics. Notice I'm not saying astronomy. So I'm in this room with a bunch of physicists. I'm the only woman in the room. That's fine. That's normal. I'm used to it. I don't think about being a woman at work. I just think about being a physicist at work. Great. Perfect. That's the dream, right? We're doing the journal club. The person presenting has not read the paper. It's very obvious and embarrassing, but like that's usually how it goes. And so we get to a 
plot, a violin plot, and he's reading the caption because he has not read the paper and he has to tell us what it says, so first he has to read it. And this absolute clown, this absolute loser, just goes, ha, those look like Now, we live in a society, and when someone does something embarrassing, like says the word at work and then pauses for laughter like that's a joke, the polite thing to do, you ignore it, you give them the space to like realize their social faux pas and they recover from it and like everyone's fine and no one talks about it and it's fine that that's what happens like it's like when you like fart in an elevator everyone just ignores it to be chill it's fine but because this is the type of person that thinks it's appropriate to incorrectly label these plots aloud as plots they look like not that also means that this is the type of person who just God, I don't even know how you can be this type of person. Like, you know the type of person where they say a joke and no one laughs, and instead of being like, oh, no one laughed at my joke, they go, no one must have heard my joke. I'll just repeat it louder. So we're all just sitting there in the uncomfortable silence of like, why would someone bring up that work when this guy goes, and then again, pauses for laughter. Now, None of this is a problem. These plots do not offend me. Some loser saying at work does not offend me. What happens next is the problem. It's because everyone else, like if there's 12 people in the room, it's this loser who thinks it's funny to say the word and like that's a joke. And me, the only one with and 10 allies who, who want to support women in physics, what happens next is they all turn to me to check in because they're nice and they want to be like, are you uncomfortable? Is this okay? So they all look to me with the word in their brain. I'm the only woman in this room. I'm, I'm the only woman in a lot of rooms in physics. That's just the way it is and that's fine. But I don't like it when 11 men are looking at me and thinking the word it does make me uncomfortable. It does make me feel embarrassed. It does make my face red and make me think like, great, now it's pointed out that I don't belong here and I'm the only woman in the room. Fantastic. And I have a choice at that moment. I can choose to make fun of this guy, right? I could be like, it's really embarrassing that you just said the word mad work, but what's worse is that you paused for laughter. What is the joke? Do you think the word is funny? Why is it funny? No one's laughed yet. Do you want to try saying it again louder? But then like, I'm the bitch and I don't want to be known as a bitch at work. So unless I'm willing to turn this into like an HR situation, which I'm not, like these plots alone are not offensive. This fucking loser screaming work is definitely more embarrassing for him than for me. So my real only option is to be like, yep, they do look like I guess and then let the speaker jump in and move on. And, and you know, for the rest of that journal club, I'm gonna be checking every paper to see if it has a violin plot because I don't wanna go if it's got a violin plot because that guy thinks that joke killed. He went home to his mom and he was like, I told a really funny joke at work today. You fucking killed, I'm hilarious. And he's just gonna say it again. And I don't wanna deal with that. So now I'm not gonna go. And like, that sucks. I'm not the only woman to say this. These plots are not offensive, but because women are underrepresented in physics, they lead to unfortunate situations which make women feel uncomfortable. And I don't like that actually. And when you combine that with the fact that these plots are bad, they're ugly, and they're bad representations of data, why did you put this in your paper? What was the goal here? Why would you do this? Honestly, I didn't want to include this part because my big point, the main point here, is that these are bad ways to show data. And you can prove that by just taking any one of them and making them better. But the little bow on it is that it does make women uncomfortable. Because there's a certain type of person who you can have a conversation with and you can be talking about a thing and they totally agree with you. And then when you say, and also, it's like a feminism issue. They suddenly turn on a dime. They're like, how dare you? How the first amendment scientists need, are you trying, are you trying to say biology is not real? And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll give you an example. I don't know if that made sense. Like I like the Batman Begins movie and I like the sequels less, <laughs> right? 
And so if I'm having a conversation with someone about how I like Batman Begins a lot, I really like it, and I feel like the sequels got worse. Uh, they, people often agree with that because they usually like the Joker one and then nobody really likes the last one. It's just not very good. And we could talk about how like, oh, it's, I really like a detective Batman and he really wasn't that detective-y and like the timeline was weird. I didn't really like that last movie. And they'll be like agreeing the whole time. And I'll say, I really like Christopher Nolan as a director. I really like the way he shoots action scenes. I don't like the way he does sound design. It's always really bad. And I'll just be like, yeah, of course. Yes, I agree with you. Let me tell you about my feelings. And I'm like, of course. But then when I say, and also he doesn't really write women well. So I prefer his movies where there aren't that many women. The, this person, this version of a person will just turn on you and be like, how dare you say that? He's, he's an auteur. How dare you say he can't write women? What about this woman? What about this woman? My girlfriend once said that she liked the writing, so how can you say he doesn't write? And it's just like, whoa. Like, there's a version of a person who agreed with me when I said the plots were ugly. And they agreed with me when I said it doesn't really make sense to combine those two pieces of information. Like, one is going to be more important than the other, and you should really highlight that. And you're just kind of covering it in a shadow when you make these violin plots, which are hard to read and hard to look at. And by the way, how are you doing this moving? Where's the axes? What is the values here? What is the point of this? They all agree. They agree with it. And then when I say, and like sometimes it can lead to uncomfortable situations for women, they're just like, how dare you? You know? But I realized that the exact same person that would say, oh, these look like at work is the same person who's gonna like flip-flop when I say and oh sometimes women can be uncomfortable so I really don't care about that person's opinion so I thought I should mention it because other women have also mentioned that this can make them uncomfortable so this is the real end of the video you be the judge here I've highlighted how these are ugly but that's just like my personal opinion I've highlighted how they show two pieces of information they show an average and they show a distribution and one of those is always going to be more important and the more important thing should be highlighted and the other thing should be relegated to a table, relegated to the discussion section. This plot does not do a good job showing your data set because, as evidenced previously, you can always, always, always make this plot better and easier to read than what it looks like, just using whatever image editor you have. So it doesn't make sense to ever put these in your papers. These plots are bad, 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 bad. And also, by the way, sometimes like it can make things uncomfortable for women, but that's not the most important thing. That's just a little bow on the shitty package that is these plots. By the way, don't people always save their most important argument for the end? Isn't that how law works? You do it in your closing statements? That's not how law works. I'm gonna point out one last thing to you. Unlike real the flaps on violin plots are always symmetric. There's no reason for this second flap to exist. Why are you copying the histogram over? That makes the plot more convoluted. Every single violin plot that looks like this can also look like this without any change in the, the bad way the data is presented. Don't get me wrong, this is still bad. So why did you double it? I'm really asking. This is always the same as this. So this was an aesthetic choice. Do you think this looks cool? I mean, it's bad at showing data, so it's never gonna be a good plot, but do you think this looks better than this? Do you think it looks like Is this a joke? Is it a joke to you? Can you explain the joke? Why is it funny?
So I, I only went to like three Reddit threads with the Data's Beautiful violin plots, they're real popular over there, and uh, I just thought it would be funny to compile all the comments where everyone is like, ha, 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 the same joke, ha, ha, the same joke, and I'm just baffled by it. It, yes, this looks like, but that's not funny. That's not a joke. That's just observation. Like, is it 1987? Are we all Jerry Seinfeld? Like, oh, what's the deal with plots? That's not a joke. That's so lame. And you'll just see comment after comment after comment of the same joke. So like, not only did you think the lame joke, you saw comment after comment of the same joke and you were like, Haha, I'm gonna add my hilarious version of this to the pile. That's not funny. We're better than this, Randall Monroe. Actually, he was better than this because like his add-on is like just a little bit funnier, but it's still lame. Yeah, it looks like, is that the joke? Explain the joke. I just, I might just have a traumatic trigger response to reference humor because I did have to date men in the Talladega Nights era where just quoting a movie out of context passed for a joke and they would also pause and expect you to laugh. Like just saying the word does not a joke make. Yes, it looks like where does the joke? We're better than this. This is so lame. Ugh. I'm actually writing a video about Erwin Schrodinger right now and I'm just gonna copy and paste this exact rant. Every time I say the word I'm just gonna overdub it with Schrodinger's cat because it's the same thing. Just like, oh, I'm referencing a thing. Everybody laugh now. Oh, you, you didn't laugh when I said Schrodinger's cat out of context. You must not understand it. Can I explain Schrodinger's cat to you? Like, oh my God, it's exhausting.